Dr. William Lee, President and CEO of the Angiogenesis Foundation, shares new research on food as medicine and is then joined by Dr. Mark Hyman, Head of Strategy and Innovation at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, and Dr. Darius Mosafarian, Dean of the School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University, to discuss the impact of what we eat on our health. To kick off this session, Are We What We Eat? I wanted to reflect back on the experiences that we've had worldwide in the past year. This was an extraordinary year where we've all, as humans, suffered the same uh, impact uh, uh, of the pandemic. And all of us, no matter where we lived, where we came from, what we did, and, and uh, who we are in terms of our cultures, have actually had to struggle with the same set of health circumstances. Uh, this session uh, is really going to talk about nutrition. But I think the last year in reflection has given us a new lens by which, through which we can actually look at the importance of our nutrition, where we've come from, and what we've learned uh, over the last year, and how we can think about protecting our health uh, into the future. Confronted with a brand new human disease that we knew very little about, uh, uh, we actually were all struggling with the unknown. And so one of the things that I asked was, how are we going to actually overcome the situation through understanding? And I think this understanding component is the beginning to finding solutions, not just for illness, but for health, not just for the food we eat, but the communities in which food is actually served. And that's one of the themes that we're actually going to talk about today. Now, what I wanted to do is to um, just describe for you a little bit of the journey that I actually had. Um, uh, I decided that as a researcher, uh, I could try to contribute understanding of what uh, the illness of COVID-19 was doing in the body. And so obtaining tissue from people who unfortunately had died of COVID, we had the opportunity to take a international team, a truly amazing team of global researchers to dive deep and to explore what was actually happening inside the body. And that's really what I want to be able to show you um, is what we found and how this actually reveals what we might actually uh, think about going forward. This image is actually the picture of the beautiful architecture of the circulation of the healthy lung. And we were able to compare this beautiful architecture to what happens when COVID infects the lung. And as you might see from the image uh, that is uh, 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 coming up, uh, the, the infection actually has serious consequences for the architecture. In fact, it disrupts and destroys most of this beautiful architecture. And what we find in people who have survived COVID, um, uh, on the far right hand side, you can see that the blood vessels, which are um, uh, shown here in three dimensional reconstruction are dramatically uh, reduced compared to the healthy lung on the left. In the middle, is an example of a COVID survivor whose lungs um, continue to uh, suffer from some deficit of the circulation. And this is six months after the infection itself, the so-called long COVID or post-acute um, sequelae of COVID that we're all dealing with right now. We've also found this out that this can actually affect the heart. And the left-hand side is a normal heart uh, with beautiful circulation uh, vessels going forward. And on the right-hand side is what happens when COVID infects the heart. Now we know that the food we eat can help or harm our circulation in the same way that we know that um, this, now we know that this virus can actually har help and harm our circulation. So the questions that we've been asking are, since we don't have all the answers from hospitals or doctors, and we, since we actually have learned how to care for our health um, in our homes with our food, what are some of the lessons that we can be learning from this experience of reconnecting in our own kitchens, in our uh, markets, in our grocery stores, in our pantries over the last year? And how does science actually help us think about the role of nutrition moving forward? And now to further explore the impact of culture and what we eat and the impact of what we eat on our health, I'd like to welcome my friends and colleagues, Dr. Mark Hyman and Dr. Darish Matsafarian, 
Welcome, Mark and Dari. It's great to have you with us. There's a lot to cover, so let's dive right in. Um, Mark, uh, eating is one of the most connected acts that we perform every single day, and you talk about food as medicine. Can you tell us what that means and share a couple of solutions that you feel are win-win solutions for everyone? Absolutely. You know, I think, I think for a long time, we've thought of food as sustenance, as nourishment, as calories, as energy. But the science is radically showing us that within food, there are molecules that are driving health or disease that are independent of the typical things we think of like protein, fat, uh, carbohydrates, and fiber. And it turns out that the power of food to transform our health is really quite dramatic. When we take out the, the harmful foods and we add in the protective foods, the body has a chance to reverse all sorts of chronic illnesses, which are now affecting um, millions of people around the world, six out of 10 Americans and increasingly globally. And so we have this moment in time where we can recognize that food is the most powerful drug on the planet and has the capacity to cure or heal most of the chronic illnesses that we're suffering from and address the fact that 11 million people die every year. And I think that's conservatively from lack of protective foods and too much of the uh, harmful processed foods. And, you know, we're all physicians uh, uh, sort of in this panel. And isn't it remarkable how much more there is to learn compared to what we actually started out with? And I think that's one of the reasons that we want to actually, you know, consider our future um, by reflecting a little bit about like where we've come from, because, uh, you know, as science moves us forward, um, we actually have our own origin story of our knowledge. And so Dari, you know, um, uh, thinking about where food's human origins are and the fact that food is extremely intimate to all of us as individuals and our families and our communities, and our societies, and, and I feel really importantly as our cultures, can you maybe give us a little bit of a frame of how the history of nutrition um, has shaped our thinking about food and how that's now dovetailing in with how we think about medicine and health? Well, absolutely. You know, if, if we don't know our past, we're going to make mistakes going to, into our future. And I'm not going to talk about all of the history of food. For millennia, people have thought about food for national security, for health, for, you know, all sorts of things. But really talk about modern nutrition science, you know, the last 100 years or even really the last 90 years. How did we get where we are today? And, and it, 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 you know, it, it's really safe to say, I think, that nutri modern nutrition science may be the, mo the newest science we have of all of our, of all of our sciences. I would date the birth date to 1932, less than, you know, 90 years ago when vitamin C was the very first vitamin isolated and synthesized. So think about that. It's been less than 90 years since we've been able to actually identify and synthesize any vitamins in food. And what happened there really quickly was for the first time, people were able to show that vitamin C could prevent or treat a disease, namely scurvy. For at least a couple hundred years, the, the British fleet had been putting lime in their watered down rum, thinking maybe it prevents scurvy. That's why the British sailors were known as limeys. But it really wasn't until 1932 that they proved that there was something in food that could prevent or cure disease. Now, what happened, Will, over the next 20 or 30 years was this explosion of science, understanding all the major vitamins that we know about, vitamin D, vitamin C, all the B vitamins, vitamin A, and so on. And each of those was linked to its own disease. So vitamin A to night blindness, vitamin D to rickets, and, and so on. Now, the accident of history is what else was happening in the 30s and 40s was the Great Depression and World War II which led to huge fears about food shortages. And then in the 1950s, this recognition that the population was exploding and we were gonna have worldwide famine because we weren't producing enough food. And so all that confluence of the science, of the Great Depression and World War II, of the recognition of the growing population led to the idea that our priorities for food have to be two things. Let's produce as many starchy, shelf-stable, inexpensive calories as we have to prevent mass starvation. And let's fortify those starchy, shelf-stable processed calories with a few vitamins and minerals so we don't get scurvy and night blindness and rickets and so on. So that those two concepts, the idea of the green revolution to increase you know, monocropping of, of cheap, cheap crops and to fortify them with vitamins was really drove our modern food policy throughout the last century, all the way really to the 90s. And so it wasn't really until the 90s or that we started 
really seriously paying attention to food in relation to obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancers. And so now what we have is a legacy food system that was created over about 70 years to do exactly what it has meant to do, give, give cheap calories to prevent mass starvation and fortify them with vitamins. So if you walk down any cereal aisle, that cereal aisle was purposely created to, to, to have those products. But what we need to do now is, is shift that legacy food system toward understanding nourishment, prevention of chronic diseases, optimal processing of food, all things we can talk about today. And since we did it purposefully and successfully, you know, less than 67 years ago, we can do it again. Uh, we can shift the food system toward where we really need to be. Well, and that's really interesting because if you uh, think about how you refer to um, uh, human experience, to societal need, to innovation, which has taken us further and further away from uh, the origins of food, uh, uh, and then think about the interconnectedness that we are now discussing in terms of how our environment has affected um, our agriculture, which you know, at some level may have actually even affected the, um, um, the jumping of uh, the coronavirus that led to this pandemic. You know, all these interconnected um, pieces are part of a macro food system. And so, you know, Mark, you know, you're, you've written about um, the food system, you've given a great deal of thought to it. Um, can you uh, help us frame how we should be thinking about the relationship of food systems to global health, our economy and society, the environment. And, and, and now, of course, one of the biggest issues facing us is our climate uh, crisis. Absolutely. You know, I think, I think this, these are all interconnected. Food is the nexus for all these global crises come together. Uh, and before I jump into that, I just want to sort of reflect back on what Dari said about the, the desire to produce a lot of calories. We did that. We're good at it. But we forgot that the information in the calories matters. And as I mentioned about food as medicine, what we eat has the power to change our gene expression, alter our microbiome, regulate our immune system, affect our hormones, affect our brain chemistry, affect our structural system. So food literally with every bite transforms our our biology in real time. And, and I think this is an important insight that's come out of science. As far as the nexus where all these pieces come together, it, it's quite striking. Uh, you know, they're all seen as siloed problems. We have our health crises, our, our economic crises, our climate crises, our social crises, and they're all seemingly distinct and separate, but they're all linked by food. And, and for example, it, global health is, is really disastrous. We're seeing massive increases in obesity and chronic disease globally. Uh, now there's over 2 billion people overweight in the world. A chronic disease is the number one killer globally, not, not infectious disease, almost by double. And, and, and in developed countries, even developing countries, we're seeing this expand. And, it, and it's burdening uh, societies. It's, it's decreasing quality of life. It's, it's burdening our healthcare systems. Uh, and that is a massive issue. Just with COVID, for example, you look at the, the burden uh, of chronic disease and obesity related to COVID, you're six times more likely to be admitted to the hospital and 12 times more likely to die if you are obese or have a chronic illness. Um, and the economics of that are staggering. You know, one in five dollars in the American economy is spent on healthcare. About eighty percent of that is for chronic, preventable disease, mostly caused by food. And globally, it's expanding. Uh, I think the World Economic Forum said that globally, over the next twenty years, it's going to cost forty-seven trillion dollars to deal with chronic disease and its impact. Uh, and then, of course, there's the the uh, social issues. I think we're not really recognizing. We see these health disparities in America, and a lot of them are related to food. If you're African American, Latino, you're five times more likely to end up in the hospital with COVID and your rates of diabetes and obesity and chronic illness are, are disproportionate. So health disparities are often driven by the foods that are available to these populations. And, and lastly, we have the environmental and climate crises. Uh, environmental crises staggering. We're seeing ecological collapse around the world, desertification, we're seeing the uh, collapse of uh, pollinator species, 75% of pollinators are gone, 50% of livestock species, 90% of edible plant species. We're destroying our natural waterways through runoff from nitrogen fertilizers that are just in the Gulf of Mexico alone, killing over 200,000 metric tons of fish. And there's 400 of these around the world that 500 billion people depend on. So this was just a little tip of the iceberg. And in terms of climate change, you know, it's, it's not really well appreciated that climate change is driven primarily by our food system end to end. And that means agriculture, food waste, uh, processing, distribution, transport, uh, deforestation, soil erosion, all these factors together uh, account for 40 to 50% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and, and the good news is that by addressing the food system, by improving the, the way we grow food to regenerate soils and regenerate ecosystems and, re and produce food that regenerates human health, 
we can solve all these problems, not in silos, but as one, um, as, as one coherent problem that's linked to food. You know, that is a grim and overwhelming uh, <laughs> picture. And, uh, but there's you know, good news. There's good news. <laughs> it's fixable. It's totally fixable. And, and let's talk a little bit about um, the fix. I mean, Dari, you've, you know, you've actually spoken about um, uh, fixing global food systems as an important priority uh, as we move into this century. Um, can you f- give us a frame for, uh, you know, how one would go about approaching uh, fixing food systems? Well, the, the first thing is recognition, right? If you don't recognize the problem and prioritize the problem, we're not, we're not gonna fix it. And so I think that that is happening, that people around the world are starting to recognize that, that food is making them sick and the food system is broken uh, and governments are very slowly starting to recognize that and businesses are, are starting to recognize that. So compared to even five or 10 years ago, people see that lives are being you know, destroyed and, and our environment is being destroyed and that money is being left on the table. And so businesses and governments that invest in sound food policies can actually have huge economic benefits. So that's the first step. I think now that we have the recognition, people wanna know, well, what should we do? And and the short answer is there's no silver bullet. We can't just do one thing and expect all this to go away. Food is not tobacco. Food is not a simple thing that we can ban or tax and just get rid of, right? We, We need to eat, we need to produce food. We need to do it nutritiously, sustainably, and equitably. I would say there's three major priorities, three major things we, we, we can focus on among a suite of larger things. You know, one is science. We really have to uh, have a kind of a, a global moonshot to understand more nutrition science. We're just starting to scratch the surface of how we produce and how we eat and how we prepare and process food affects the thousands and thousands of nutrients in the food, how those affect the thousands of bacteria in our bodies and all of the other pathways. So we really need to double down or, or really, uh, uh, you know, hundred fold down uh, on the science investment to push the science forward. Number two, and Mark mentioned this food is medicine. And I would, the way I would use food as medicine is to use healthcare dollars, which is one of the biggest expenditures around the globe to actually pay for healthy eating. So that instead of just having your healthcare system pay for expensive drugs or surgeries or other screening procedures that it also pays for healthy food. And then the third really priority, especially for governments, is what I would call true cost accounting for food. So, uh, you know, not just trying to understand the simple economics of, of, you know, when we grow a crop or when we sell a food, what does that do for the tax base, but do the full true cost accounting of, you know, the environmental costs, the human costs, the productivity costs. If we do formal quantitative true cost accounting, you know, we will see that we are undervaluing healthy foods, protective foods, and we are selling far too cheaply foods that are harmful. And so I think true cost Mm -hmm. is a very powerful way and and starting to take root as a way to to really understand uh, the policies to address uh, our food system. Mm. You know, and during this process uh, to sort of address and write uh, the food, the global food systems, we are watching a health, we're watching health systems around the world struggle with um, the problem of obesity, for example, and all the interconnected chronic diseases, Mark, that you actually um, talked about. So somewhere uh, uh, we have to be able to actually not wait for the future. We need to act on the present in order to be able, as we're moving uh, towards the future. Um, to some extent, we're regenerating the health of the planet, and we're also regenerating the health of our society and our, on our and we and our regenerating mm-hmm. health as individuals. Um, what's the best way, Mark, that you think that we can actually achieve these parallel goals at the same time? I mean, I think what Dari had a lot of these issues, but what you're talking about is really key. How do we create a regenerative system that regenerates planetary health, ecological systems? Uh, reverses climate change and regenerates human health, restores communities, restores our economy. These, these seem like grand goals, but when you when you look at food as a lever, it's probably the most powerful lever we have to address all these disparate issues, which are really not disparate. And the power of, of a certain number of policies um, to transform this globally could be really impactful. And, and Dari uh, wrote a paper, uh, an, an editorial for um, JAMA recently on prioritizing nutrition security. And, and it, it's really framing food as not just nourishment or calories, but as, um, 
as medicine. And that, and that when you do that, quality matters. And nutrition security means having adequate access to foods that promote health and prevent disease or even reverse disease. Right now, that's not possible because 60% of our calories are from ultra processed food uh, made from three ingredients that are highly supported by government policies, including corn, wheat, and soy that are turned into all manner and color and size of processed food that is driving disease. And for every uh, 10% of your calories that comes from these foods, uh, your risk of death goes up 14%. So we, we need to start by thinking, how do we create a, a different system that um, starts at the farm, goes from the farm uh, to the factory, to the you know grocery store, and to the kitchen in a way that actually breaks that cycle. And, and the only way to do that is to start to shift our policies. One, to really focus on quality. And that's what I think uh, Dari is referring to by nutrition security. Every, every single policy we have around food should focus on nutrition quality and the quality of the food, not just the, the adequacy of calories. Two, we, ne we need to think about how do we regenerate our agricultural system and restore these uh, communities, which are really struggling in farmers. And, and the movement around regenerative agriculture, I think can do that. There's a movie called Kiss the Ground, which sort of lays some of this out, but increasingly globally, we're recognizing that regenerative agriculture not only helps to re restore ecosystems and reverse climate change, but produces food that's more nutrient dense, that actually helps uh, prevent a lot of the conditions that we're trying to address. And that's sort of a win, win, win all the way through. It restores ecosystems, reverses climate change, conserves water systems, produces food that's more nutrient dense, farmers make more money, and it's sort of win, win, win. So we need policies that drive both food as medicine within, within our society, as well as regenerative agriculture to create a more regenerative system. And then of course, you know, Dari mentioned a little bit, there, there are many uh, things in our food system that are are driving the marketplace, whether it's marketing uh, to children of, of processed foods, whether it's uh, confusion around food labels, whether it's our school lunch program guidelines or dietary guidelines or or um, the 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 uh, SNAP program or food stamp program. These are you know American centric programs, but globally, I think there are similar programs. And by reforming those programs to infuse the idea of nutrition quality. Uh, and, and regenerative health uh, is, is, would be, I think, a very important metric. Well, one of the things that this conference um, has really distinguished itself from uh, other conferences that focus on science and focus on policy and um, focus on uh, uh, the processes uh, of innovation is that um, the Vatican Conference has always focused on bridging the gap between those subjects and our humanity. And this is really a, a unique opportunity for uh, the two of you to actually weigh in on the humanistic aspects of the food system as well. And um, in, in particular, an interesting topic to think about is the issue of science and faith and food. Um, Dari, why would people of faith, why should people of faith care about fixing the food system? Well, I think, you know, food is uh, central to almost uh, every religion and culture. It's, it's one of the most foundational activities of being alive is to, is to eat. And for humans, it's become not only foundational to, you know, uh, just our basic human needs, but it's deeply embedded in many uh, faith-based practices, uh, in many holidays, uh, deeply embedded in, you know, how we interrelate with each other in our families, sitting around the table, uh, you, you know, it's, 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 it's one of the most fundamental aspects of human culture. And I think what has happened is that, you know, we've changed the food system and how we relate to food, how we grow food more rapidly than almost any other foundational human activity. Even compared to 200 years ago, um, you know, food is so, so different now than it has been for the hundreds of thousands of, of years uh, that yet humans ha have evolved. So, so I think if you're of faith uh, and, and you care about you know, culture, you care about nourishment, you care about equity, you care about health, you care about the planet, then you know, all of these issues are, are crucial. Um, and so you know, someone of faith who cares about you know, uh, uh, justice and justice for the poor, um, you know, that's one of a central tenet of almost every faith. You know, food is one of the biggest issues that in a vicious cycle, keeps people who are, are less advantaged than others down. Um, the children don't learn, can't get enough food to, 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 to grow and, and even live sometimes. Their parents get sick. 
And so it creates a vicious cycle um, for health. I mean, almost every religion talks about honoring your body and caring for your body. Uh, and, and so I think that for health, you know, food is one of the most foundational things. Uh, and then again, circling back to just, you know, practice and tradition, food is, is embedded into almost every religious tradition. And so we should be thinking about uh, serving healthy foods for, for those religious traditions uh, uh, as well as to address poverty and to address health. So based on this conversation, it's really clear that we're beginning to have recognition of what the challenges and problems are in our food systems, but also the opportunities for us actually to move forward and to create better societies and really tap into our humanity to be able to help our communities and to really help uh, co global cultures. So, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I think maybe we are at a juncture in order to be able to explore new paths uh, for food and health. So uh, I'm interested in just sort of opening this up to you guys to say, how do we do this exploration? What is it going to look like? How do we you know, um, help individuals at the same time as appreciate what we're learning from populations and to help populations, how do we actually move forward? What are some of, of your ideas? Well, I'll jump in quickly. I, I think, you know, one of the things that I've learned and I, I actually had a chance to go to Haiti after the earthquake and learn about Paul Farmer's work, which put people in communities at the center of healthcare, not doctors and hospitals. Uh, and use community health workers to drive changes around infectious disease, TB and AIDS. But I realized that most chronic disease and certainly obesity are contagious. They may not be infectious, but they're contagious and they have to do with the social determinants and environment in which we live. And, you know, Nigel Crisp, who was the former head of the National Health Service, uh, wrote a book um, called Turning the World Upside Down about putting people in communities at the center of healthcare. And he also wrote another book called Health is Made at Home, Hospitals are for Repairs. And I think we have to understand that in order to deal with our global health crisis, the solution isn't in the doctor's office. I can't cure diabetes in my office. It's cured on the farm. It's cured in the, in the food processing plants. It's cured in the grocery store and in the kitchen and the restaurants. That's where we have to focus. And so creating a decentralized, democratized healthcare system. That's not about the sick care system we have, although we need that, right? We need to go in for repairs and I've certainly had my share, but we, we also need a parallel system uh, of, of community health workers, which we had in this country years ago to go and, and help people reclaim their kitchens and reclaim their land. I mean, we had uh, community gardens that during World War II that fed 40% of the population. We had extension workers that went around to young families and taught them how to grow garden and grow food and eat fresh food and make food. These are the kinds of initiatives I think will make a real difference because if we rely on, you know, um, top level down strategies it, 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 in healthcare systems to solve this, we can't, I see this working within a healthcare system. Uh, you know, we're so entrenched in what we're doing that even though, for example, we know we can cure diabetes through changes in diet, we're so focused on heavy use of medication and we don't build the structures to help people change their behavior. And we know how to do that just because we're not skilled at it in medicine doesn't mean it's not possible. And we've seen this. We, we worked with a faith-based community where we, we got people in small groups to work together to live better. And, you know, 15,000 people lost a quarter million pounds and got healthy within a year. And we're doing that at Cleveland Clinic with our shared medical appointments. And there's all kinds of opportunities to, to focus on the, the population, which is what we're not doing. And I think one of the biggest failures opportunities during COVID is for the United States government and governments around the world to focus on the issue that uh, we are so metabolically unhealthy that COVID is causing more damage in our populations. Uh, you know, we know, as I mentioned before, that if you're overweight or obese, you're more likely to get sick and die from COVID dramatically. Uh, and we could be talking about how we need to upgrade our health, upgrade our nutrition, take care of ourselves and, and affect our immune system. We know that sugar suppresses uh, you know, immunity and, you know, whole foods improve immunity. And I can give you example after example. So we, we have to start to think about a, a new type of healthcare system that is outside the walls of the hospital and clinics. Great. Dari, we're almost out of time, but what's your single recommendation? That what, would, what suggestion would you actually make to improve and, and going forward with food and health? Well, I, I think that, you know, humans have been able to adapt and improve their environments uh, uh, throughout human history. And when they recognize a problem and they want to create a solution, and we did that in the 1950s with the Green Revolution and the processing of foods to meet a specific need. And we need to do that again now with food. And so we need to 
incentivize innovation, advance science, get governments on the same page. This is win-win for everybody. This is win-win for the farmers, win-win for the food manufacturers, the restaurants, the people, the planet. We can do this mm -hmm. if there's recognition and political will. Well, that's all we have time for today. And I wanna thank um, Dr. Darish Masafarian and Dr. Mark Hyman for joining uh, in this really invigorating conversation about food and health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.